Good morning, Steadfast. Good, morning. good to see all of you here. I hope you had a great week, and I hope you have a good week this week. Uh, we've had plenty of rain, so I believe that's going to back off this week. May have some sunshine. May have some 95-degree weather, so don't get out there and have a heat stroke. Uh, just remember all of our sick and shut in. Just, just pray for all those people. And we've had a couple of deaths this week. Randy Cruz, who used to run a Hodgeville machine shop up here, his wife died, Vivian. So pray for the Cruz family. And also Billy Duncan died, who's a past sheriff. So uh, remember, remember remember those families. Uh, is there others in our congregation or in our community that we need to remember today? 
okay? And if you're a visitor with us, we want to welcome you to Steadfast Baptist Church. If you don't have a home church, we'd love to have you to come back and visit with us and become a member of Steadfast Baptist Church. So uh, we try to be just what we call down-home people and just do the best we can. Uh, we've got a, a new pastor here. Been here about a month or over a month now, so uh, things is looking on the uptrend. So you invite somebody to come to church. Uh, this COVID has put us down. Uh, we've just been, a lot of people haven't been coming because of that old virus. So, but we'd love to have you. The mass things are about gone. I think most of you have had your shots and stuff. So uh, we just want to get back to normal. And we're going to try that this coming Sunday morning. The men are going to have a breakfast. And so uh, that's going to be at 8.30. Uh, so all men are invited. You don't have to bring anything. All you do is just bring an appetite. And uh, that'll be sufficient. So all you helpers is going to help cook. Be here at 7.30. And the meal will be at 8.30. All right. I think Pam has something. Where's Pam? She wants to say something. Good morning. Um, I don't know if any of you noticed when you first came into the church, we have a little set up there that we had Spring Haven that came to church and spoke, uh, spoke a couple of weeks ago to us about um, what Spring Haven's all about. It's our domestic violence shelter. And um, there's a website that you can go on. And this web the website tells you about different ways that you can support that group and the items that we need right now or that they actually need right now are like uh, juice boxes like Capri Sun, any flavor, uh, plastic cutlery, solo cups, gallon sized plastic bags, baby laundry detergent and nook wide uh, baby bottles. So I've got a list out there if anybody's interested in supporting um, Spring Haven, that's, those are the items that they're needing right now. So um, there are also other ways, if, when you go onto that website, there's other ways that you can also donate. And it tells ways, one of them is if you shop at Kroger's, that if you've got, um, if you have a uh, Kroger community uh, card, what it does is you tell the organization that you want a, a money to go to and when you go and shop and you use your uh, Kroger Plus card it actually goes to the uh, to the it donates that money to the the place that you choose so that's different ways that you can actually give and then it, on the website it also actually tells other ways as well so um, this is a this is a really good uh, group that I think that we need to support. So if you're interested in that, that's the way to do that. Thank you. I don't know how many of you uh, really know Miss Vicki McClure. She usually sits back there with my wife. Uh, she lives over in Buffalo and she's been coming to this church regularly. Thursday morning about six o'clock, she had a massive heart attack. And so uh, the ambulance was called and she actually called him herself. And when she got to the hospital, she had another major heart attack. But I went to visit her yesterday, and Vicki looked good. And we got to, yesterday afternoon late, we got to report that it uh, didn't do any damage to her heart. So that's just a miracle in itself. We prayed for her Wednesday night, so there's another sign that prayer works. So uh, just keep Miss Vicki in, in, in your prayers, because uh, I think she's going to do a little rehab, and then we'll, we'll go from there. But... Uh, she definitely needs your prayers. And also I have a card. Uh, it says, Dear Church Family, thank you so much for the thoughts and prayers. They are greatly appreciated. I have a scan on the 16th. Pray it comes back clear. Thank you again, Miss Sharon Sowers. So at this time, I want to just lead us in a prayer for Miss Sharon and also for Miss Vicki. So if you bow your heads, wait a minute, one more thing. Who was it? Brad Oh, okay. He sits right back here all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll lead us in a prayer. Please bow your heads. 
Lord, we just lift Ray up to you uh, in the hospital and got problems. So he's been faithful to coming to church, Lord. And so we just love him. He's just a really good man. So if be your will, Lord, you just heal him. And Miss Vicky also, Lord, you just heal her. So we had bad news, and but we got good news. So we see, we pray for her Wednesday night, and we just, we just see that those things work. And Miss Sharon, Lord, uh, this test, she's just asking that we pray that it come back normal. So, Lord, we, we ask you that. Your word says if we don't ask, we're not going to receive. So we just need to we ask you for all, all these things. So we just do that in your name, Lord. Amen. All right, anything else? Anybody else we need to mention? All right, if not, everyone please stand. We're going to stand. I say, I stand amazed in the presence. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful, is my Savior's love for me. <clears throat> for me it was in the garden, He prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for His own grief, but sweat drops of blood for me. <clears throat> oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me sure you don't want the water i just put bananas uh, okay, right. you have your prayer dear heavenly father we just thank you for the day we just uh thank you for your grace and your mercy and your healing and you being the great physician we thank you for vicky and uh the no heart damage lord and uh i just praise and exalt you this morning thank you for a praying church and uh i pray that we don't lose sight of the need to keep you first and to not do things on our own strength, but through your strength, Lord. And help us as we dig into your word this morning to understand that as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, brother. I had no bronchitis about three weeks ago, and it just stayed with me. I just stayed choked up, and I don't know. Uh, I went to the doctor, and uh, it just comes on me ever so often, so I apologize for not getting through that song right. Well, we're going to try it again on 533. You may remain seated. 
Uh, we're going to try He Lives. <coughs> I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. At just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to Him for. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see His loving care, and though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that He is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of His appearing will come at last. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to him for. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, oh Christian. Lift up your voice and sing Eternal hallelujah To Jesus Christ the King The hope of all who seek Him The help of all who find None other is so loving So good and kind He lives, He lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to him for. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. All right, Miss Pam. All children.
looked good, but I forgot it. All right. Miss Penny will bring our special music today. Also, while she's coming, uh, Miss Helen was telling me earlier, she was talking to Lisa and I overheard really, uh, her son has got a problem, a skin problem, and we need to pray for Wendell. And also, uh, Cindy, her daughter-in-law, she broke an ankle. Was it ankle? Did you tell me right? She broke the ankle. She, she broke her ankle. So uh, they had to put a rod in there and all that kind of stuff. So uh, pray for Wendy and, uh, Wendell and Cindy. So they, they got just home problems. couple announcements as well, and I know that Ronald Dale talked about some of them, but I want to reiterate, next week is a big week. We have the men's breakfast at 8.30. If, if you wanted to help, come at 7.30 to help prepare, uh, but it's Father's Day as well, so there'll be a Father's Day service, but more importantly than all of that is a baptism for Asia and a baby dedication as well. 
So it's a very special day in our church family next week as we celebrate baptism and baby dedication. With that, if you're a parent in here and you have a child or if you know somebody and you've been discipling somebody that needs to be baptized, I would like to speak with them this week if they want to be baptized next week. Um, so I want to just kind of offer that as an open invitation that uh, we will be uh, baptizing Asia next week. But if there are others that, that, are, uh, that you know of and you'd like them to talk with me this week during the week, just want to kind of open that up as well um, so we can celebrate even more. But uh, another couple good things. Uh, Miss Gail, she made it to Florida safely, so that's good. Um, hopefully you're listening in this morning. If not, you'll see it at some other point. Uh, we miss you already. Also, it's a little bit of a change to your announcements in your bulletin and the slideshow. There is going to be the Women's Cottage Prayer this Thursday, and that's going to be at the Gaddy's house at 630. So uh, I was informed of that this morning. So that's at 630 at the Gaddy's house, Women's Cottage Prayer. Lastly, I wanted to do something that I don't know that we've done in here Ever, definitely not since I've been here, uh, but I want to give a, a, a praise offering for Vicki McClure. Now, th it's amazing that we had a, a church that rallied behind her in prayer, and I just want us to take a moment to praise the Lord and give him a clap offering. If you guys don't know what that is, we're just going to clap and say thank you, Jesus, for that. And if you don't know, it's okay to do that sometimes. All right, it's okay to clap and praise God. Amen. All right. Uh, this week uh, we're continuing our series in First John. Hopefully, I'm giving you guys enough scripture as well as we're going through this that it doesn't seem like an arduous task to continually go through a book of the Bible. But I think that that is one of the most pure ways to study is to continually go through it. For instance. Uh, Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians and a lot of the books that Paul wrote in the Bible were actually meant to be read in the gathering in their entirety. So if you were to go to church in the first century, the uh, pastor of the day would read the whole book of Ephesians or the whole book of Colossians. Now, our church is a whole lot shorter in, in duration than they did in the early church. They would have church all day or all week or whatever. But, you know, I just want you to know that this is a, a thing that used to be normal in the early church was going through an entire book. So we'll spend several weeks ourselves going through a book and explaining it. But in the early church, these were letters written to churches and they were meant to be read in one sitting. So you would read the whole book all the way through and then they would explain what it meant. Um, but our system is a little bit different today, and we, we're going to go through it bit by bit. If you missed last week, again, uh, check it out on YouTube or check it out on Facebook. Um, we're looking at also possibly next week, as long as we get the computer set up right, being live for the service on the radio. If you didn't know, I'm, we're already on the radio, but I have to record a, a much more condensed version of the sermon, and then uh, Abe 93.7 plays it. But... Actually, hopefully next week, as long as the computer works out, we will, uh, a portion of the service will be live on the radio. So you'll be able to hear it here in person. You'll be able to hear it live on the radio. You'll be able to hear it on YouTube and on Facebook. And uh, th that's important because we're able to reach people all over the world with the good news of Jesus. So um, it, it's really a blessing that we're able to reach out in this way. But things that we learned last week are, more importantly... Your blessed assurance, the, the assurance that you get, that, that you know, that you know, that you know, that you're saved. And you get that through the assurance of the Holy Spirit and also through the passages that we covered last week really showed uh, that we do have assurance of our salvation. And, and that might sound like something that's not that great or that cool or whatever, but there are some faith systems out there today that don't have that assurance. They call themselves Christians, but they don't have the assurance of their salvation because they feel like they have to continually do things to get that assurance. And so we, we were able to see and, and explain through Scripture last week that we do have that assurance right now. We're also able to see that God's light sometimes exposes darkness, even in our own lives. And when that happens, there's a mandate for us to live a life of repentance. 
The uh, Great Commission in Luke calls all people to repentance. That's what Jesus says. Not just go and make disciples like in Matthew, but it's a little bit different in Luke and calls all people to repentance. This week, we're going to cover uh, verse, uh, chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And what we're going to learn is that we are overcomers of the world. We're going to learn not to love the world and what that means. But we're also going to learn that we're already overcomers of the world. And that's actually really good news because uh, we see that we can't do that on our own. So we're going to read out of 1 John chapter 2. And this is going to be, uh, like I said, 12 through 17. And this is the word of the Lord. I am writing you, little children... Because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake, I am writing you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that in you we are overcomers. You have given us so much, and most importantly, your Son. We are so thankful for your precious gift. Lord, help us to steward that gift and share it with everyone that we encounter. We love and praise and adore you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to do something a little bit different, and i got to scan the audience, so bear with me. I need some volunteers, and you're not even going to volunteer. I'm going to actually kind of point to you because I need your help. Um, I get to pick on Warren because he's my son. Warren, come up here. <laughs> yeah. St stand right here, please. Sammy, will you come up here, please? All right, Austin, you're next. Come on up here, Austin. Right here, please, Sammy. And then, Austin, you stand right here next to Sammy, please. It sounded like I repeated some of the words in those first few verses, but it wasn't me. That's actually the Word of God. It repeats in those verses. Three times, or two times, we see three different distinct categories. We see children, young men, and old men. And this is important. So we see children, <laughs> fathers, and young men. All right? It says fathers here. It doesn't say old men, all right? It says fathers. <laughs> we understand this, though, to be spiritual maturity and sp your walk with the Lord. Okay, so this is an important thing that we get to see. We get to see that your sins are forgiven. And I'm writing you fathers because you know who is from the beginning. So all of us, no matter where you walk, are children of God. Okay, so we need to understand that right off the bat. In those children, however, we do have these different categories, as we see here. Where, right here, it's represented by age, but what it's really represented is by spiritual maturity. Okay, so you may be this old, or this old, but you may be on the same level of spiritual maturity. You understand what I mean? All right, so... Verse 12, I'm writing you little children, that's everyone, so that your sins are forgiven for his sake. I am writing you fathers because you know who he is from the beginning. And we see, uh, we saw in the very first um, intro to 1 John, in the beginning. And we saw it in Genesis, and we see it in John, and we see it in 1 John, and we see it in Mark, in the beginning. That's what that's likened to. The fathers know from in the beginning. I'm writing you young men because you've overcome the evil one. Again, I'm writing you fathers because you know who's in the beginning and young men because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. All right. He is strong 
not because he is full of vigor and youth and he's a young man. He's strong because why? The word of God abides in him. All right, you guys can be seated. Thank you. So it's important that we rightly divide this word here, verses 12 through 14, and understand really what John's getting at. Verse 12 again. I am writing you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. So I want to focus on the end part of that. So scripture is never meant to be overly complicated. Everybody's supposed to understand it. All right. And the illumination of the Holy Spirit really does help you discern those great truths. Just like in an English sentence, we got a, a, a main topic or a main subject of that sentence. And the main subject of verse 12 is because your sins are forgiven. And, it's, and that's a great truth. But we have to understand in this sentence, in this verse, why your sins are forgiven. And, it, and the key here is in the last few words, for his namesake. By the name of Jesus alone, the sins are forgiven. Also, we need to understand, and we see in verse 12, the purpose of your salvation. The purpose of your salvation is for his namesake. It's for God's glory alone. A lot of people don't really understand that concept, and they don't understand what salvation is for. Your salvation isn't for you. Your salvation is for the glory of God. You and me really do get to benefit from that, but that's not the purpose. The purpose of our salvation is to give glory to God. That's it. It's very, very simple. It's for His namesake. Another way to view it is our salvation is a blessed byproduct of God showcasing His great glory. We see this personified in the Old Testament. Moses, he's up on the mountain, another where he 40 days. Right? And he comes down, he's carrying the, the tablets that contain the Ten Commandments. And what does he see? He sees Israel worshiping golden calves. And he gets angry and he breaks the tablets and he gets upset. And God is ready to destroy Israel. And this happens actually a few times. God says a few different times in a few different places throughout the first five books, Moses, stand aside. I'm going to destroy all of Israel. And I'm just going to start over with you, Moses. And what does Moses do? He pleads. He begs. He gets on his face. He lays prostrate before the Lord. He says, Lord, please no, don't kill your people. Remember, you saved us from Egypt for your glory. Remember, God, you saved us so you can be glorified to the Egyptians. So you could take those ten plagues which coincided with ten gods of the Egyptians and you show that you are the one true God. That's what he was getting at. Your glory. Israel's salvation was for God's glory. In the new covenant, our salvation is also for God's glory. Yay, that's awesome because we get that great byproduct of it. We get to be saved because of it. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus is our personal Lord and Savior. We're to come to a personal relationship with Him, but He's not saving just me. He's not saving just you. He's saving all who believe on Him, who trust in Him. The personal Lord and Savior thing, that is an American individual Christianity concept. And what it does is it makes it very much about me, me, me. Not about God, God, God. And, and, and while we do get saved, we have to remember the main purpose of the salvation. We need to think of, of our Christianity for His namesake in a kingdom perspective. And Christ is the only king of that kingdom. Not you, not me, not anybody else. That's it. Jesus is the king. Verse 13 and 14, we're going to kind of combine a little bit. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. Jeremiah 31, 34. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each brother, saying, Know the Lord, 
For they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. You're not going to have to teach somebody the Lord. After they come to know, it's going to be written on their heart. Just like it was prophesied in the Old Testament. The heart of stone moves to a heart of flesh. The law gets written on their heart. You're not going to have to say to the believer, know the Lord. Remember, they had to do that in the Old Testament because a lot of it was, like we learned last week, out of obligation. That's why it's an old commandment and still a new commandment. What we learned last week was, love your neighbor as yourself was told in Leviticus, an old commandment. But they had a heart issue going on. And in the new covenant, the new commandment, the same one, love the neighbor as yourself, is new because the heart is changed. And it's the same thing that Jeremiah is talking about here. You're not going to need to know the Lord in the same way that they did in the Old Testament because your heart has changed. And it's something that's completely different. Verse 14. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. This is what we were talking about with the illustration. The young man is strong. He's not like the child in, in, in the nursing infant in the faith that gets uh, tossed to and fro by different doctrines, right? As the wind changes, that infant in the faith may change and may listen to this person and that person. But what's the characteristic of the young man? The word of God abides in him and he's overcome the evil one. He's already fought some of these battles. There's a little bit of a, like a, a soldier mentality, and it's not just because I was in the military. There's a little bit of a soldier mentality that says, you are strong and you have overcome the evil one. Well, we overcome the evil one through the strength of the Word of God. I want to read to you something that I'm going to try my best to get through it without crying, so I might read it fast, <laughs> but it's the end of Romans chapter 8. And uh, the whole part of Romans chapter 8 really talks about life in the Spirit. And, and the part that I'm really going to hit on is the part that talks about being more than conquerors. And one of the reasons why this is really precious to me is the, the second and I guess the last church that my grandfather planted was down in Florida. So he planted a church in New York and then he retired and he moved down to Florida. And then God called him out of retirement and he planted another church. But this church, the second church, was called More Than Conquerors Ministries. And I, I, from an early age, I actually preached my first sermon when I was 16 in Florida in More Than Conquerors Ministries. And I think I may have told you guys this. It was like 10 minutes long. I said everything that I had to say like extremely fast. And I looked at my grandfather and I was like, that's it. Like I'm done. I don't know what else to say. Um, but it's near and dear to my heart this because this was the life verse of the church that they're more than conquerors. And um, I might get a little bit loud. I won't run through the aisles or anything like that. But this this verse really speaks to me and it should speak to all of you. I'm going to start in the second half of verse 31 and I'm going to finish out the chapter. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also not give us graciously all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who is the one who is raised at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are being regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. If that doesn't pump you up, if that doesn't get your blood flowing, knowing that we are more than conquerors and we've already overcome the evil one, I don't know if you've got the Holy Spirit in you. I'm just going to be honest. That should pump you up. That should excite you. We are more than conquerors because it is easy to succumb to the world. And that's what we're going to talk about next. 
It is easy for us to be overcome by the evil one. But the young man that has the word of God abiding in him has already overcome the evil one. We have already become more than conquerors through Christ. Let's move to verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In your bulletins, this is talking about the world cannot give you what you need. We know and we're going to really hit on towards the end of 1 John that God is love. And I'm going to say something here that might throw you for a loop, and I hope it does because then you're going to really listen to what I'm saying afterwards. <laughs> there is a love that God hates. There are things that God hates. So let's look at that a little bit. And you say, well, what does God hate? If he's a God of love, he's God is love, he can't hate anything. Let's read. Psalm 5, verses 5 through 6. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Psalm 96, 7, 10. O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of the saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Or Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies. And one who sows discord among brothers. James 4.4 4 likewise talks about becoming an enemy of God. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with the God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Well, why do you become an enemy of God if you love the world? I'm not talking about the world that God created. And more specifically, the image bears the crowning glory of his creation. That's us. I'm not talking about hating that. For David even says in Psalm 19, 1, one of my favorite psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. We are to love the creation. We're to love the world. And more specifically, we're to love one another. So what's the world that we're supposed to hate? This is to love the things that God has not intended for us to love, the things that do not glorify Him. This is when we love the creation more than we love the Creator. God hates it when we put things before Him. To be clear, we're talking about a loving of the world that hated Jesus. So in, verse, in John 15, 18 through 20, He's very, very clear. If the world, and this is Jesus speaking, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world will love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. This is the world we're talking about. The world of abortion. The world full of evil. The world of murder. The world of corrupt practices. The world that is full of Satan's schemes. The world that Satan runs and rules. If you don't believe me, Ephesians 2, 2. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now work in the sons of disobedience. Following the course of the world. If you didn't know already, Satan is the prince and the power of the air of this world. This is the world that we're talking about. This is the schemes of the devil. He's very good. He's got a lot of uh, institutions that are his. We know that. This is not the place from the pulpit to speak about politics. And so we're not going to go there. But both sides of that coin are very clearly under Satan's schemes. And if, you, and if you need your eyes open, it's time to get in the Word instead of a news channel. It's time to see what, the, what God says about the sins of this world and not Fox or CNN. 
It's time to get the real news. Something that can't be called fake news. We must oppose the anti-God worldview. You see, even truth today is considered subjective. The fact that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life is under attack. In modern thought, everybody's truth is subjective. Everybody's just looking for their own truth. Well, that's a falsehood that on the surface sounds good. We're just seeking our own way. We're seeking our own truth. But that is an, an affront straight to Jesus' words himself saying that he is the truth. When we think that we can seek and find our own truth apart from the word of God, we're falling under a snare of the devil. What we're talking about in this verse of not loving the world is hating sin. When, talk, when Jesus is talking about hating the world, he's talking about hating the sin of the world. And more importantly, it's not just talking about hating the sin of the world. It's talking about hating your sin. And this is where it narrows down. We're talking about the sins that you do. When you start to hate your sin, when you start to grow close to God, you're going to see the sin very clearly in your own life. Psalm 119, there's three verses I'm going to pull out of that. 104. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. 113. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. 163. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. You see, David here in Psalms 119 is very clear. Because he's growing closer and closer, he's now part of the Father's category. He's growing closer with the Lord. He sees the sin in his own life. And he sees the sin around him in the world, and he's hating it more and more and more. The closer you grow to God, the more you're going to hate your sin. You can be rewarded in a, in a different kind of way for hating sin. Hebrews 1.9 You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. What does that mean? You have put wickedness aside. And so you're going to get the joy that comes with that. You're going to get the joy that knows I'm serving my master. The joy of the Lord. In Revelation, in the beginning parts of Revelation, we see Jesus. And he's speaking to John and he's saying of all these things of the churches. Those seven churches that he despises. Things, there were a couple churches that did okay. But the church of Ephesus, he has some very, very stern things that he's saying to them in Ephesus. But there's one thing that he says very clearly to them that's good. Revelation 2, 6. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I want you to see there's a difference there. What he says is he hates the works of the Nicolaitans. He doesn't say you hate the Nicolaitans. He hates what the Nicolaitans are doing. That's the whole adage, hate the sin, but love the sinner. Too many times we are quick to say, this person's doing this, this person's doing that, and we're quick to point a finger. Jesus, when he's talking about the church to fix the church, he says, hate the works that they're doing. Hate the things that they're doing in my name, but don't hate them. Because who are we to judge the unbeliever? Have we forgotten how, how far apart that we were and how much we have fallen as well? Because it's very easy to stand up here or to sit in the, the pew there and say, well, hey, I'm in church. I'm okay. It's you out, outside the church. That's what you guys need to fix it. Well, I thank God every day that I'm in here because not that I'm in here on my own doing or that I'm a good person. We've, been, we've beat that up throughout all of 1 John. No one is good, not one. Yourselves included, myself included. So before you go point that finger, see what Jesus is saying to John in Revelation. He's saying, worry about their works. Their works are what is, is setting them apart. He still loves them. He still came to die for them. 
but his, their works is what he's concerned with. Verse 16. What the world promises, it will never be able to deliver. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. This is one of the most important verses in the Bible, and the reason why it's one of the most important, because we see a threefold tactic of the enemy. The devil is old, but he's not ancient. He's old, but he's not eternal. And he tricked Eve in the Garden of Eden. And he used these same three tactics. And we're going to expand on this a little bit, but I want to read Genesis 3, 6 first. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Quick side note, Adam wasn't like across the garden and this was all Eve's fault. Adam was right there with her. A lot of time people miss that part. And maybe, maybe I'm glad I'm sa- I didn't say this on Father's Day because the fathers may take me outside the church and stone me. But Adam was there with her. He didn't stop her. Anyway, that's a side note. That one's free. <laughs> all right. So these three things that we see in verse 16... The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, we see in the very beginning at the fall. Eve, what did she see? She saw that the tree was good for food. Desires of the flesh. Gluttony. You know what? Gluttony isn't always for an obese person. Gluttony is, you know you're not supposed to do something, or eat something, or consume something, and you do it. The best example is Eve and Adam in the garden. They knew they weren't supposed to consume it, but it looked good. It looked good to them. It looked like it tasted good. So desires of the flesh, they wanted to eat it. Right there, desire of the flesh. Right here, it was a delight to the eyes. She saw it. It was good for food, desire of the flesh. But she saw it was a delight to the eyes. That's desire of the eyes. And then the tree was desired to make one wise. That's pride of life. So again, we see desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not... That's what John's warning us of, but that was from the very beginning. We are like the way... The the reason we are how we are is because of the fall, is because of these three things from the beginning. It's right off the bat. And John is highlighting the fact Eve did this already with Adam. Let's not fall into the same thing that put all of humanity into condemnation from the beginning let's break it down desires of the flesh again this can be ranging from sexual immorality to gluttony and again gluttony is not just overeating it's eating when you know it's not good for you right like if you have diabetes and you're to the temple and you say well i'm just gonna go ahead and uh, eat as much cake as i want and then give myself an insulin shot Or, I'm going to make myself throw up after I gorge on a buffet. Or, I'm going to do this. Eating disorders and things like that. Desires of the flesh. We have to remember, we are not sinful because we sin. We sin because we're sinful. Now, let me say that again because that's a little bit tricky. Our nature... Ourself, our fallen state. We don't. I got to read it because I'm going to back. Screw it up. So, we are not sinful because we sin. We sin because we're sinful. Because of our sinful nature is the reason why we sin. What do the desires of the flesh look like? Galatians chapter 5. We know Galatians chapter 5 to be the fruit of the Spirit. But let's talk about the beginning part of Galatians chapter 5 16 through 21. And these, again, are the desires of the flesh. But I say, walk by the Spirit. If you will not glorify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Here we go. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, 
envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those things and those that do them will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's very clear. These are the desires of the flesh. It's spelled out in Scripture. This is not an all-inclusive list. There's more, I'm sure. But this is just a really good list that Paul gives the Galatians. The desires of the eyes, the next one. The eyes are not necessarily inherently bad. Proverbs 21.12 says, The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. So God created our eyes, God created our ears, and they're not inherently bad by themselves, just like creation is not inherently bad by itself, but it's what we do with them. Oftentimes the desires of the eyes can lead to sins of the flesh. Men, not you, we, have to be extremely careful about this. You may have heard me say it before, and you're going to hear me say it again. Your spiritual diet is hugely important to your walk with the Lord. We know, and since we're talking about the flesh and gluttony and stuff like that, we know that people watch their diet, what they take in and what they eat, because of health reasons, because of maybe pride of life, they want to look good. All right, But more importantly, what's your spiritual diet look like? What are you taking in with your eyes? What are you listening to? When you turn on your radio and you're driving to work or you're going somewhere, are you filling your mind with music that's of God? When you're reading, are you reading things that glorify God and give you things close together? When you're scrolling on your phone, are you looking at things and, and consuming with your eyes things that are glorifying to God? Your spiritual diet is more important than your physical diet. Because this body is passing away. We're going to see that here in a little bit. This body is passing away. But your works and your things are going to be exposed very soon. So what are you feeding yourself spiritually? Now, the pride of life. The third thing in, in 16, the pride of life. This pride can look like a pride of power, of possessions, of prestige. Things like that. It could be all about me, me, me. It could be like we talked about earlier, viewing your salvation as about me. That's pride. Viewing it not in the light of it's all about God. That's pride. We saw that in the very beginning in the fall. Why did they want to eat the fruit in the first place? Because Satan's lie from the very beginning. You'll be like God yourself. We have constantly tried to be like God ourselves. We see it in the Tower of Babel. We try to be like God ourselves. We try to get to God because we want to be like God ourselves. That's what that pride is. Let's look a little bit in contrast how Jesus handled potential pride in his life. About birthright and status. Sometimes we get prideful about that. He was a carpenter's son. And his family was poor. What about your pride of possessions? The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What about the pride of pedigree, where I come from? They mocked him and they ridiculed him. They said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? What about the people that you're associated with? Sometimes you won't hang out with other certain types of people because of your pride. What about Jesus? He hung out with sinners and tax collectors. What about the pride of intellect? I can do this on my own because I'm so smart. I don't need any help from anybody. Jesus says, as the Father has taught me, I say these things to you. And lastly, the pride of self-will. I want to do what I want to do. What did Jesus say? If you are willing, take this cup from me. But if not, your will be done. Those are from some very stark contrasts that Jesus showed us in his life that we probably don't do in ours, myself included. The last verse, verse 17. This world is temporary. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. We talked about it briefly a minute ago. The world, along with its desires, all these different things, desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, pride of life, and anything else 
that's not God and not eternal, is passing away. But you and me, if we're in Christ, we will abide forever. So what's, what's the takeaway? What's the learning point? What's the application? Set your sights and your goals and your dreams and your aspirations on things that are eternal. Like we said in the beginning about your salvation being for His namesake, for His kingdom, His eternal kingdom. Second Peter paints a very vivid picture of what this world is going to look like on the day of the Lord. Second Peter chapter 3, 10 through 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt away as they burn? That's pretty vivid. The world is going to pass away in fire. The works and the empty things that you have done will be exposed, it will be dissolved. And they'll be shining through, whether they counted for something or counted for nothing. So why do we say fix yourself on something eternal? You need to feed on Him and drink on Him. John 34, this is Jesus speaking. And He could have anything He wanted to in the world. Satan actually offered it to Him in the desert. But what does He say? My food is to do the work and the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. Or when he fed the multitudes in the wilderness. What did he say? Jesus said to him, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Or to the woman at the well, what did he say to her? Everyone who drinks of this water, talking about the well water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up. To eternal life. So I urge you, don't worry about the things that are passing away, the world that's passing away, but focus on the things that are eternal. And more importantly, let's go back to the first part of this passage that we're talking about today. We are more than conquerors in Christ. We have already overcome the evil one. And since we have already overcome the evil one, don't slide back into these desires. This is not to say that everybody's going to be perfect. We saw in the beginning of this book that we're going to slide. We're going to fall. We're going to sin. We're going to make mistakes. But that's why we have the advocate. That's why we can go to Jesus. But don't live in it either. Don't live in it because we need to walk and live and understand that we are, in fact, overcomers. We have overcome the evil one. We are more than conquerors. What an amazing thing to know that through Christ, we have overcome the world. This world, this satanic scheme, this prince of the power, the rule of the air, we have overcome it. Not through our own ability, but through the blood of Jesus. So we should be grateful when we come to this realization. It should humble us when we come to this realization. We should be like Moses and be prostrate on the ground before him thanking Him, worshiping Him, because it is all His glory. It is all His doing that we're able to be these overcomers, not our own strength, not our own accord. We have a helper in the Holy Spirit, and we should never lose sight of that, that we're always counting on the Holy Spirit and the sanctification of the Holy Spirit to help us grow incremental from glory to glory to glory to glory. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning. We thank you that your grace is sufficient for us. We are so grateful for you, Holy Spirit. Help us to never forget nor to diminish your work and all that you do. Thank you for helping us to be that overcome, overcomer through Christ, through you, Jesus. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. This morning, I hope that as we're singing this song and we're, and we're thinking about our own lives, I pray that it's a time of deep reflection.
I hope it's a time that you will grow closer with him. That it doesn't have to be up here, but it can be right there where you're sitting. And that you're, you're understanding his love for you and how deep it is. And I just pray for that for you this morning. Please stay.